imagine that. So I, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't mention this first service, but um, someone got some new kicks for Christmas. <laughs> Uh, my kids, my kids are like, Dad, you wear the same shoes. We need to change that. So my super uh, cool kid stepped in and said, we're going to, you can go on Nike. You can design your own shoes, your own colors. Here's the best part of the shoes. You guys don't get jealous. Okay. Don't get jelly right now. But on the heel, my life verse, Colossians 128, right on the back. Is that awesome or what? So, um, I'm not one of those pastors who spends thousands of dollars of shoes, all right? So you guys, remember, I shop at Ross, right? So spending a hundred, it was a Christmas present, but I had to pay for it. So is it really a present? A uh, hundred bucks for shoes, that's not too bad. But uh, thank you to my kids for super fly shoes. So in the words of my daughter, slay, all right. So um, Acts 1 is where we're going to be. Turn your Bibles there if you would. So um, uh, good to be with you. We get to dive into a, a, a new series this morning. So I love movies, if you guys didn't know this. And uh, I really feel, you know, every year this happens, right? Christmas time, all the movies you want to see come out at the same time, right? So I literally didn't see my family for two weeks. I just went to Harkins the whole time. My diet was popcorn and root beer, and I saw a lot of movies. This, did anyone see a lot of movies this year? All right, so the one that I really was looking forward to, Matrix Resurrections, it's very polarizing. Who watched it? Who saw it? All right. Who loved it? Raise your hand. I loved it. Who hated it? All right. You did, Dan. All right. We'll talk. Well, you buy me lunch. You can tell me all the things you don't like about it, right? But here's what's hard. Sequels are hard. I mean, tell me a movie that had a sequel that was, the sequel was better than the original. Shrek? Young Guns? Harry Potter? Ooh, that's a good one, right? That had like lots of sequels to it. What did someone say? Toy, Toy Story? Star Wars. Star Wars. Oh, for sure. That's like a gimme, right? So, but, but isn't it true? Rarely is the sequel as good as the original. I mean, once the original comes out, it really sets the bar so high. It's like, okay, how's this going to measure up? And are they replacing actors? And is the story going to go in a direction we didn't? You know, Matrix, right? It was really more the love story this time around, which I really, really appreciated. So um, I'm not here to endorse that. I'm just here to say, you know, sequels are hard. The Bible has a, a double feature sequel story involved. And in case you didn't know this, it's the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Matter of fact, write down Luke, write down Acts. Luke is volume one, it's, 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 it's story number one, but Acts is volume number two, story number two. What people don't understand is so many times we approach the Bible as if this, it's this disjointed, really not connected series of 66 books. But Luke and Acts is a double feature, two-part series. And the reason God gives this acts is he wants you to know the sequel is as good as the original. Now, I'm not saying that the book of Acts and the story of God's people is greater than the story of Jesus, God's son. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is there's a reason why there's two volumes called Luke and Acts that God has put there for us to understand that the sequel should be as good as the original. How God works through his son is, is equally as exciting as, as, as God working through his people. Matter of fact, by Luke, write this down. It's volume one, the story of God's son. Acts is volume two, the story of God's people. And the two form a, a, a double feature that is unheard of compared to any other double feature out there, right? I, I wanted to start this series because I felt like when we were done with Luke, there was still more to talk about, which is why wrote, Luke wrote the, the volume of Acts, which the two together, let me just tell you, is the most any New Testament person has written. Luke occupies the majority of the New Testament. Paul, Paul comes close, right? Paul wrote a lot of little epistles we call Philippians, Colossians, Galatians. But Luke, between Luke and Acts, has written more than Paul. He's the number one most prolific writer in the New Testament. And he wants you to understand that as important as God's work is through his son, his work through his people is equally important. You remember what Jesus said? He said something really curious. He said, greater work shall you do and you're sitting there going, wait, you're the Savior. <laughs> you're the Lord. You're the King, right? What do you mean when you point to us, Jesus, and say, greater work shall you do than me? 
Certainly he's not saying that what he's going to accomplish on the cross is not important. He's not saying that. But I think what he's saying, there's going to be crackly microphones say, I'm sorry. What he is saying is this, your sphere of influence in leaving Palestine and going to the remotest parts of the earth is going to be more important than what I'm, I'm doing right here in this location. And that's really the book of Acts. Remember the title for Luke? What was the name of my series for Luke? Jesus for everyone. That's the gospel. Male, female, black, white, employed, unemployed, it doesn't matter who you are. The gospel is for everyone, right? Acts is, the, is that Jesus is for everywhere. Meaning there is not a place in this world that should not ultimately hear the gospel message. So many times we contain the gospel as if it's just for church. Can I just tell you right, right now, if we're gospel people, we've got the gospel, we're good. The gospel needs to go into more, more important areas. Our lives are continually framed by the gospel, but there's so many pe- places outside of where we gather for church that need to hear the gospel. So what you're going to see and what we're going to see in the book of Acts is the church mobilized. The church gathers to scatter. The idea that Jesus is for everyone needs to be heard everywhere. And so whether it means your gym or your, your bank or your, your favorite coffee house, which we all know Sozo, right? Or, or, your, or your favorite you know, library or your favorite grocery store. It doesn't matter where you are. Where you are is where the gospel should be. That's why the message of Acts is so, so important. Because I don't know about you, but all I know is that the church has got a bad reputation. And let's be honest, we've brought this sometimes upon ourselves. Like if I was to ask you, what does the word church bring up? If you were just to talk to people and say, tell me what you think of the church. What do you think, how do you think people would respond? Tell me, what do you think, man on the street, woman on the street, what do you think of of the church? What would they say? Judgment, hypocrites. hypocrites, two positive characteristics right off the bat. I like this. Money grab, Money grab. three. Any positives? First service had a couple positives, but it's interesting. The first service also led with hypocritical, judgmental. Nice. Nice, <laughs> nice is nice, isn't it? Perfect. But, but you guys... Isn't it interesting our first go-to is to think of the negative qualities? And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, we're a part of the church. You guys realize, like, we're assessing ourselves, and it's like, wait, am, am I a money grabber? <laughs> am I judgmental? Am I? Probably. Probably. I think we all fall in those categories. But, but I believe Acts reminds us of who we ought to be. It's really a book about identity. Write, write that word down, identity. Who we are and what we're called to do. Because you know the word church is interesting. It's a word that literally means, you're gonna to wanna to write this down because this is good, a movement centered on a shared conviction. That's what the word church literally means. But again, if you were to ask people, what is church? A lot of people would say, it's a building. It's, it's that place in my neighborhood that either has Methodists or Lutheran or Bible or Baptist or something in the title, right? Rarely do people think of church as a movement. They tend to think of it as an institution. And I want to deinstitutionalize the church. Not that the institution's bad, but here is what has happened for hundreds of years, the church has become a place that dispenses religious goods and services and has forsaken its mission to be a movement to take Jesus everywhere. And let me just say, I'm not pointing fingers. We're guilty of this as well. So if this is what the church is to be, the book of Acts calls us back to what this movement is to be about. And this is why I'm excited for this. I'm, a, I'm excited to, to not only call this a place where the church can gather, but I'm also more excited about the fact that we, have been, we gather in order to scatter. 
that when you leave this place on a Sunday morning, and if it's 10.30 is your service or 12.15 is your service, you are entering a world that desperately needs to hear the hope and the good news that's found in Jesus Christ alone. Because if the gospel's for everyone, then we need to take Jesus everywhere. Amen? So we dive into the book of Acts. And, and I want you to know that Acts is a book of action. I mean, we're going to see uh, incredible proclamations of the gospel. We're going to see amazing transformations of the gospel, incredible conversations, incredible conversions. Thousands of people come to know Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. There's shipwrecks. There's political intrigue. There's, there's, there's religious battles. There's a whole bunch of stuff in this book, right? And you get to the very end, Acts 28, and you know what the last word in the book of Acts is? Unhindered. And you know what that says to me? The work of Acts continues today. While, while Acts may close with 28 chapters, it actually doesn't close at all. We're Acts chapter 29. The church today is Acts 29. Because if the work of God was so important 2,000 years ago, it has continued to be so important for 2,000 years and is now in our hands to continue to do the work that he wants us to do, unhindered. You know what that means? God is building his church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. We're gonna come back to that here in a moment. But it's sad because I think a lot of believers, and let me just say, I heard one church leader, listen to this. No, no one here, because no church leader here would ever say these things, just so you guys know. But one church leader said one time, I have been a church leader in my church for years. I have built church buildings. I have raised money. I have served on committees. But one thing my church never gave me was a relationship with Christ that would make my life exciting. I wonder how many people are in that place. They attend. It's a good program. The band's awesome. Watching them lead worship is like watching Zumba. It's amazing. Some people call it rapture jumping. I don't know, whatever you call it. But there's a lot of people that are part of the church. They go to a place. They're in a location. They're a spectator in the audience watching something happen off on the stage that they're totally divorced from. And they leave that service thinking that, hey, I've done my job as a Christian. And their life remains uneventful and unexciting. And I want you to know, there's more to following Christ than that, what I just described. I, I really believe that this is a year, if however the Lord tarries in his return, we, we pray he comes today, but if not, I pray that the book of Acts spurs us. It, it, it sets our hearts on fire for something more. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. So if you turn to Acts chapter 1, four points I want us to look at, and boy, this is so good. And I've actually taught through the book of Acts, I think this is my fourth time, so I did it in my college ministry, I did it at our previous church, and I've actually done it twice here, so we did it about seven years ago. But here's one thing I never do, I never go to my old notes. I never look and go, what did I say? I believe the word of God is living and active. And that what God wants to say to us today is not what he wanted to say to us generally through six years ago. There are timeless theological principles that never change. That's true. But I think the application of what we're going to discover is going to be fresh and new for us. So this is, a, this is fun. This is exciting. And I think it's going to be a five-year journey through Acts. So Luke was, Luke was 22 months. Acts is going to be five years. So Yay, we're in for the long haul. Like, we're married. This is serious now, right? We've moved beyond attraction and courtship and dating. Now we're fully engaged and entering marriage together. So you guys ready for this? Yeah, let's do it. Acts chapter one. Look at verse one. The first account I composed. So isn't that cool? He references volume one. The gospel I wrote about Jesus. Theophilus, this is the guy he's writing to about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. May God write his eternal truths on our hearts this morning. So we're going to tackle three verses. So at this rate, you can see 10 years at least, 10 years together. Four things I want us to look at that are so, so important. The first point is this, the continuation and our purpose. So you notice the word began, right? Obviously, Luke, which Luke is referring to, his first account written to this guy named Theophilus was what Jesus began. Luke is all about what Jesus began. Acts is about what Jesus continues. Isn't that awesome? Right? In a sense, we look at the Gospels, the, the, the account of Jesus, and, and we fully embrace the philosophy that what Jesus said on the cross is true. It is finished. The work he has come to do, do is complete, right? Death, burial, resurrection, perfect, perfect substitute, holy divinity for sinful humanity. It's finished. But Acts tells us, but yet it's not finished. The saving work of Jesus is complete. So I'm not arguing uh, against that, right? But what I am saying, though, is that Jesus is still actively working through his people for the gospel work of the kingdom, and that's what Acts is about. So it is finished, but yet it's not finished. Because he says, there are sheep that are not yet part of this fold that still need to be brought in, right? Right? That there, there's a harvest that's so ripe that Jesus is looking for workers to continue to be a part of this work. That's what Acts is about. This is why the gospel will go from Jerusalem to Samaria to Judea to the uttermost parts of the world, that the work continues. Yes, Christ's work on the cross is complete and it's sufficient and it's perfect, right? But the gospel still has to change lives until the day Jesus comes back again. There's still eyes who haven't seen, there's still ears who haven't heard, and there's still hearts that have yet to turn from stone to flesh. And I love that crackling. It, it makes me so excited every time I hear it. It's like, <laughs> nah. <laughs> so began implies continuation. So, so Luke is what Jesus began. And notice who he's writing to. This is what I really love about the, the scriptures is that there's historical context. There's, there's a lot of validity and evidence that tells us that these, these scriptures are from God. He writes to a guy by the name of Theophilus. Now, if you look at his work, name, you guys, it's a Greek name, but all of us could figure what Theophilus means. Theos or Theo is God. And Philos comes from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, right? So that word love, this is one who's loved of God. That's what his name means. Isn't that cool? Like when you think about names, I don't think our parents think about names when they name us, right? Like Scott, oh, this is kind of so boring, right? What does it mean? I don't know. Doesn't mean lover of God. I think it means wanderer, which just probably is pretty appropriate in a lot of ways, right? My mind, the way it works or whatever. So, but Theophilus is a lo one who's loved of God. I believe Theophilus was given this, these writings from Luke and he became a believer in Christ through Luke's writings and now he gets to mature in Christ through Luke's writings. He's one, because Luke intentionally says, I've written these things to you, Theophilus, so you, that you would believe in the one and only son of God, Jesus. My first account told you what Jesus began to do. This new account is going to tell you what Jesus continues to do. And so that's how we can understand this, this, this book of Acts, that God is still working. Even though the son is seated at the right hand of the father, he is not finished. He is working through the lives of his people. Luke, God's son, or God, you know, God's son, and Acts, God's people. And he's working. And this is what it means to be the body of Christ. You ever heard of the church referred to as the body of Christ? His body is someplace else. Now we are his body made up of all different types of people, all different types of individuals. The book of Corinthians, Paul says, some of you are the, the big toe, some of you are the kidney, some of you are the, the skin, some of you are the tongue, right? But no one is the complete body, but together we make up the body of Christ. There's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. 
I did, I was in college ministry for a long time. And in college ministry, we did a lot of crazy things. Uh, I mean, our college ministry, we had chainsaws that I used for illustrations and uh, weird things, right? Things that I couldn't get away with now because of uh, laws, uh, <laughs> to say the least. But I remember I, I dressed someone up as an ear, right? I had this full on, like this, this, this prop and it was an ear. And someone walks in the room as an ear and everyone's like, that's weird, creepy, right? Like, but can you imagine like, th- that's what, an, uh, that's what a, a Lone Ranger Christian looks like. Is as if one part of your body just walked into a room. I mean, no one would believe their eyes if there was like a, a disembodied ear just kind of floating around, traveling around. That's what, that's what an isolated Christian, that's what a Lone Ranger Christian looks like. The ear only makes sense when it's attached to a head and that head's attached to a body. And now we have the complete, healthy, perfect shape. Some of us are big toes and you're out there scaring people to death. <laughs> Some of you are those ears that people are like, okay, this is weird. Like, uh, I don't think I smoked that much cannabis last night. Like, right, whatever, whatever. You need to understand that you are part of this thing called the body and together we get to be the church and we need each other because the ear can't operate without the, the, the nose and the nose, nose can't operate without the mouth and the mouth can't operate. You know what I'm saying? And so this is what makes us the body of Christ. Acts is not the acts of Christians. Acts is the continuing acts of Jesus in his people. That's why we are the body of Christ. Men and women possessed by Jesus himself, owned by Jesus himself, and manifesting his life individually and collectively together. That's what the church is. So the word I think of, and we're going to come back to it in a moment, is is incarnation. And, And around Christmas, we talk about the incarnation a lot. Matter of fact, it's one of those words that pops up on Christmas cards and pops up in Christmas songs. And I think we all sit back and go, what does this word mean? Hail the incarnate deity. Deity. I mean, like, what does that mean? What it means is incarnation means God took on flesh and bone and blood and dwelt among us. Jesus is no longer in the world as flesh and blood, but now Jesus is incarnational in our world through the church you now become the incarnational son in this world. You ever heard a frame like that? That's pretty awesome. And incarnation doesn't just pop up at church on Sunday morning. Incarnation happens everywhere you go. For wherever God's people are at, that's where the son is manifesting himself. You know what this ties back to? The Great Commission. Point number two. Commission in our plan. You don't come into this world and are saved by God to now adopt your own plan. I I hate to tell you this, and if you signed up for for Jesus and you're thinking you're still going to get away with what you want, you're, you're sadly mistaken. You now adopt his plan, and what's his plan? He tells the disciples... He gives them orders. Look at what Acts says. Chapter two, I mean, verse two. Until the day when he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders. And some of you are like, how dare he give me orders? Excuse me, he's the king. He's the king of kings, lord of lords. And he doesn't give suggestions. This is not called the great suggestion. May I remind us of that? If, if you need a reminder of what the great commission is, which is the orders from the king, Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Jesus for everyone. Remember that? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. So we see discipleship, we see baptism, we see instruction. And I don't like the ESV for this reason. The word in some of your Bibles says, Lo, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The going scares us to death, amen? 
Because some of us are sitting there going, who am I to go make disciples? Who am I to baptize? Who am I to instruct? And I, and I can understand why that's totally scary. The thing that makes it a little bit more reassuring is the lo, behold, I am with you till the end of the age. You know why? This is saying you can't do it on your own. Go and lo, go together. There is no going without lowing, and there's no lowing without going. This is... This, this is such a strange order to the disciples because if you think about it, what a scene after laying on them the great commission, not the great suggestion, but the great commission, he leaves. Never had a more important assignment get, been given to a less qualified group of people. Amen? Do you, don't you feel like this? Like um, 40 days, Jesus, is not enough. I need 40 years of training. So you have to understand the 40 days he was with these disciples, this was like 40-day conference, kingdom of God, let's go. And I don't think Jesus left going, oh, I don't know how this is going to pan out, but I, I hope it works out. Like 40 days, these people need to be reminded, be reminded of how important the kingdom message was and is. But here's the key, and we're going to see this throughout the book of Acts. You cannot do the work of God without the power of God, Amen. which is the Holy Spirit of God. Yes. Write down these two words, truth and power. I know Christians that fall into those two camps, but rarely do I meet believers where those camps have actually come together in a complementary relationship with each other. There are some believers who have all truth, but they lack power. And there's some Christians who have a lot of power, but they lack truth. Think about the consequences of this. Do you have zeal without knowledge? Power without truth? That's dangerous. The truth is, it's, it's, it's like going to the bowling alley and saying, I need the bumpers on my lane. Because if not, I'm going to be in the gutter, right? Like, I want to bowl strikes. God wants you to bowl strikes, but he's not going to allow you to bowl strikes without his truth. You can't have zeal without power or knowledge. You can't have zeal without knowledge. That's, that's power without truth. That's dangerous. And I, see we see, I think we see a segment of this in our world today among evangelicals, and, and we've got to call it out. But also, we can't be so truthful that we're lacking the manifestation of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Because at the end of the day, I want to be so truth-focused and yet not see the results of how the Spirit who is alive and active at this moment doing what the Spirit wants to do so that at the end of the day, no one gets the glory but God alone. Amen. Do, do you see what I'm saying? I'm going to tell you right now, first service, I communicated this, but I kind of was like, no, I don't think I communicated appropriately. So God bless for second chances and second services, right? This is so dire for us to understand and I'm not going to come across as one having understood it. I'm a work in progress. Because I'll admit there's times I do the work of God apart from his power. But I want to learn. I want to learn what it means to be dependent. And I want to learn what it means to listen. And I want to learn what it means to keep in step with the Spirit. And I want to learn obedience. Write down that word. That is probably the, the biggest word is obedience. God's power works in concert with obedience to his will. If I'm not obedient to this, I will not experience the power of God in my life. His plan must become our plan. His plan must become my plan. And there's no going and lowing apart from the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. And the book of Acts is going to show us what this looks like. And not just from a didactic teaching angle. It's going to be something I think we have to experience ourselves. And the same spirit that empowered the early church is the same spirit among us today. Isn't that good to know? I think we read the scriptures as if it's a divorced account from anything we'll ever experience. Ladies and gentlemen, the same spirit that was active in Genesis, hovering above the surface of the waters when God created the world, is the same spirit that is overseeing our hearts and our lives right now. The, the, 
Uh, so I was reading Spurgeon, which is always dangerous. Charles Spurgeon, if you never, t- I'm giving Lewis the, the week off this week, just in case you guys. So my other boyfriend that I have on the side that I see once in a while is Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, if you don't know who Spurgeon was, write down his name, Charles Spurgeon. He's called the Prince of Preachers. This guy, in one sentence, he can just convict you to the core. Um, Lewis and his writings aim for the imagination. That's what I love about C.S. Lewis. Spurgeon just takes gospel truth and just slays you. Slay, yeah, in a, in a way that you may not like, all right? So he was the Prince of Preachers. He was a pastor in England in the 1800s. Uh, like one of the first mega church ministries ever. I mean, what God was doing at that time through this man was amazing. Volumes and volumes of his ser- sermons can be discovered online, but he has a quote, and I want to share this with you, and this is, a, this is a quote that will slay you because I think he addresses really what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. He says, if Jesus is precious to you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be whispering it into your child's ear. You will be telling it to your husband or wife. You will be earnestly imparting it to your friends. Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent. Your heart will speak and your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. Amen. Now, we are like, oh, that's so good. But it's the next sentence. And, and I need to pr- prepare you for this. One sentence that quickly dissects all the, all, the, all the garbage and gets right to, right to our hearts. Here's what he says. Every Christian here is either a missionary or an imposter. Amen. Can you imagine him preaching this sermon in the 1800s to hundreds, thousands of people? And they're like, yeah, talk of Jesus' sweet love, right? And then he gets that sentence, you're either a missionary or an imposter. Oh! Those sentences do not build churches. You know what those sentences do? They either confirm your redemption in Christ or they convict you that you're lacking the power thereof. I'm going I'm to side with Spurgeon on this. You either have tasted the sweet love of Christ And there's a desire, there's a compelling within you that says, people need to hear the good news. The pastor is not the only speaker of good news. The missionaries that we support in New Guinea or India or or Bangladesh or, or Burma or wherever, right? But I, as a believer in Christ, understand that Jesus's commission is for me. That I'm responsible. I'm to be salt and light. Because that going and that lowing, while it's scary, it's reassuring. But, but to know that there's a plan that God has for us to not just be selflessly hoarding the good news, but selflessly giving it. And if there's no compelling, you're fake. And you can, you can talk up a storm. You could be like that church leader I mentioned at the beginning. I build church buildings and I raise budgets and I'm head of this program, head of this Bible. But if there is no desire to take the good news of Jesus everywhere, you're an imposter. And then to bring a little healing balm, Spurgeon says this, be wise in your generation and speak of him in fitting ways and at fitting times, and so in every place, proclaim the fact that Jesus is the most precious to your soul. See, what we're not talking about is generating some sort of missionary zeal and work to, to, to say, oh, I don't want to be that guy that, that Pastor Scott talked about. I want to be that imposter, so I better do something. No, no, no. If Jesus is in your life, he's going to be sweet to your soul. And if he's sweet to your soul, he's going to be the song that you sing and the poem that you share and and the testimony that you declare and the treasure that you uphold. And when people look at your life, they don't see anything more glorious than Jesus. I'm not saying you can't have hobbies and luxuries and all that stuff. Those are all good. But when people spend time with you, it is evident that Jesus is it. That's what what the book of Acts is going to... 
We're going to see people transformed in this. And that transformation, I believe, is going to be contagious. And it's not going to set that first century world on fire. It's going to set our world on fire today. We need this. We need to become missionaries because the imposters are not good. They're, they're ruining the reputation of the church. I mean, yeah, God's going to build this church. I believe in that. But we're not going to sit idly by and just be like, yeah, I'll just be a casual Christian. You know what I am? I'm a Sunday Christian. Yeah, six days for me, one for Jesus. Is that not tithing, pastor? I mean, I think I'm understanding this correctly. No, 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 no. What I'm excited about this year is the fact that I think God's spirit is going to prompt us to learn what it means to take Jesus everywhere. And that means ordinary people involved in ordinary places with an extraordinary message. I'm excited about you opening up your house to a neighbor that you've never talked to before and saying, come over for coffee, let's just hang out. Or you going to the park and playing pickleball with somebody. I don't know, people still play that? I heard it was a hot thing out there, but no matter where you are, there's this, this sense of, I'm going to show kindness and hospitality to strangers so that over a cup of coffee, over a board game, over something, there may be an opportunity to talk about the treasure. Point number three, conviction and our persuasion. When you're convicted of what I just described, you're persuaded to, to live a, a different life. I think what the church has done is somehow we've made the church to be this place where only people who have their lives together can be. I, I've, I've heard this from people. You probably have heard it too. I don't have my life together. I don't belong there. Right? Like, there's so much stuff... I have family members who have said, if I step into a church, that church will... will be destroyed, right? Lightning will come through. Have you talked to anyone like this? Like, and I'm sitting there going, what in, who has told you this stuff? Like, who has told you that the church is only for people who have their lives together? Because if anything, we need to get rid of the church as a country club mentality and turn it more into the church as a hospital mentality. So after second service today, yes, between second service and the football game, I'm officiating a memorial service because that's how I like to live my life. The neighbors, our neighbors, just lost their 36-year-old daughter in a car accident on Christmas. And matter of fact, last Sunday, he was texting me saying, hey, do you have a moment? And then the other neighbor said, did you hear their daughter died? And so immediately after second service last week, I called our neighbor. And so we sat down a few days ago to kind of talk about the daughter, her life. Not pretty, not glorious, she, an addict, all sorts of stuff. But still, you, you lose somebody. And as I sat with the parents there was something I said that, and I believe God prompted me to say it, there was this sense of our daughter didn't have a glorious life. And yet they were looking for any kind of hope to just kind of, what, what can we say at the memorial, right? So, and I sensed from them this attitude like, you know, and our lives aren't together, but yet they weren't saying it. And I just felt like at that moment I needed to say, you know what's, you know what's so great about God's love? is he loves us as the weak and frail and broken and messy people that we are. That's the good news. The good news isn't good news to somebody who is self-righteous and has their life all together and everything's polished and it gives the facade of, of perfection. The good news is for people who know they're wrecked. And when I said that in this conversation with, with the two parents, 
you could tell the wheels were turning like, we've never heard this before. And I said, isn't that amazing about the love of God in Jesus? Is that Jesus' label, which was meant to be a label of derision, but I think it was a label of de delight, he was a friend of sinners and tax collectors. I.e., he was a friend of people whose lives were a train wreck. He was a friend of people who, who made mistakes, who were fallible, who were imperfect, who were probably hated and judged by others because of all the silly mistakes they made day in and day out. And I sit there and go, that to me is good news. And that while we can't change the trajectory of your daughter's life, and we will do our best to focus on the good that we did see in her, here's the message for those of us who are left. We enter a relationship with a God who knows we have warts and everything. And he still loves us magnificently in that. Do, do you need to hear that today? Do you need to hear the fact that it's a good news that God says, hey, come take a shower, but before you take that shower with Jesus, you need to take a shower on your own. You don't take a shower before taking a shower with God's love. You come to him filthy and stanky and stinky and smelly and come into his wonderful grace because he loves you as you are where you are. But the promise is that he's not going to leave you that way. He's going to clean you up. That's the life of a Christian now. God is working out his will and cleaning up our lives. Right? And that's the conviction we now lead with. Can, can I tell you, nothing is... I've been in ministry for 30 plus years. I know some of you are like, boy, you're so young, right? You know, not really. Thir I've been in ministry for 33 years. That's the same age Jesus was when he was crucified. I better be, be careful when I say that. No, I'm just kidding. 33 years. Never have I been so content and focusing on what needs to be focused on. That's what I just shared with you. Telling people that they're loved as they are where they are. That the invitation of Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, all you who are judged by the world and condemned, all you who are living in this sense of self-guilt and self-shame, come and find that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the message. That's my conviction. And I'm persuaded so that now I want to go tell others about this. And let the Spirit then come in and change lives. I spent so many years getting tired in ministry and trying to change people and forgetting, oh yeah, the Holy Spirit's involved in this. <laughs> How many of you have forgotten about the Holy Spirit? We, we all have spiritual amnesia when it comes to the Spirit's work in our lives. And especially in other people's lives. And you need to, God is more concerned about a person's soul than you are. Keep praying. Keep being available. Keep being convicted by the things I just shared. And watch what God's going to do. If you've been convicted by what I just shared, and, and, it, and it makes your heart do somersaults that your love was such a divine love, we get to do something special right now, right in the middle of the message. We get to share communion together. Is this not the perfect time? To just say, yes, let's raise the cup to how good our God is and how glorious he is and how gracious he is. So I'm going to have Nick and, and David pass out the elements. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab the, the cups. And I want you to hold on to them. And I want you to think about what we just talked about. That God spared not even his own son to come and dwell with us. You know what that means? He means he came and he inhabited a body like ours and he, he lived in the mess and the filth that we lived in. And yet somehow he was sinless and perfect in that process. He made himself available to us, but he did not sin himself. But trust me, he, 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 there was struggle. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane. Think about the cross that he bore. He struggled, yet he did not sin. He was the perfect substitute for you and me. So as you sit and you hold the, the, the elements, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to take the two cups. One has a piece of bread in it. The other has juice in it. The bread reminds us of the real presence of God that he had in his, this world with us. 
that he took on flesh and blood and bone and he dwelt among us. Just like John chapter 1 says, he dwelt among us. Literally, he made his tent among us. He went camping with us. And there's no more intimate time you have with another person when you go camping. Can I get an amen? He camped with us. And he camps with us and he sees us in all of our fallenness, in all of our deadness, in all of our, our, our frailties. And yet he loves us. That's what, that's what the, the bread reminds us of. But then the blood, you know what's so important about the blood? Did you know that life is found in the blood? Without blood, you can't survive. There's this thing called oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Scientists tell me about this. I don't understand it, but I'll take their word for it. That without blood, you're dead. So life is in the blood. And the Bible says that this Savior sent for us need to shed his blood because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And we who have been crimson stained by sin in the blood of the Lamb are now made white as snow. Can I get a hallelujah from somebody? Can I get an amen from somebody? David, can you bring me a couple of the elements too? I, I won't judge you guys for forgetting me up here. No, just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Um, take the elements, hold them in your hand and reflect with me if you would. Thank you, my friend. The, uh, the bread, Jesus dwelling with us, who came to change our status from being enemies of God to friends of God. If this is your conviction, take the bread and remember what he's given for us through his body. And he takes the cup and he says, this is the, 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 the blood that is shed for you. And, and as often as you drink this cup, remember what Christ has done for us. We're white as snow now. Let's celebrate. Let's drink the cup together. God, you're so good. Your grace is evident. Your gentleness is evident. You, you've brought us into your family, which is just, it's just unheard of, and, and it's truly unexpected, but you spared not your own son, and we thank you for that. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, in our worst possible condition, Christ died for us. Thank you. Thank you for, for sparing no expense, but sending your own son for us. We who are once under condemnation, now in Christ, experience liberation. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Just when you thought you're, I'm done. I'm not. We're, we're continuing to go. So isn't it cool to have a mid-sermon <laughs> moment where we just, let's celebrate communion. Let's do it. Conviction. No, I didn't forget, Rochelle. That's why they pay me the big bucks, all right? So <laughs> conviction. So notice back to Acts chapter 1. He's given orders, right? The Great Commission to the apostles, back to, back, back to Matthew 28. To these he presented himself. What verse 3 you need to understand is so important. This is his resurrection. And he needed to present himself because these, these men and women, they were discouraged and disheartened. They thought they, their Savior died and was buried and that was the end of it. And they didn't understand the greater plan. So he needed to have these post-resurrection appearances. Notice what it says in verse 3. To these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. Circle the word proofs. There is verifiable object, uh, you know, objective evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Amazing. Appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Here's where our... You cannot have conviction of these things without first conversion to these things. If there's no conviction, I'm going to tell you right now, there's no conversion. When you, when you hear of these things, there ought to be some movement of the Spirit just saying, this is true. Without the resurrection of Christ, Christianity is destroyed. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, right? Paul says, if the resurrection didn't happen, your, your faith is in vain. This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the centrality of the, notice the gospel right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 
For I delivered to you this first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared, right? That's the gospel. If you're ever wondering what the gospel is, look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. He died, he, buried, he was buried, he was risen, and then he appeared. And then he ascended into heaven. But for 40 days, it wasn't like, hey, let's grab a quick cup of coffee because I got to get to heaven. It wasn't like that. For 40 days, he appeared to hundreds of people. This is what Paul says. Because he says, I am of the least of the apostles. Look at the, the bottom there. Unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You know what happens when you come in contact with the risen Savior? Your life is dramatically overturned. There, if, if there's no resurrection, you don't have a courageous Peter coming out of a cowardice Peter. If there's no resurrection, you don't have a persecutor like Paul of the church to become the greatest preacher for the church in the New Testament. So he appeared and his appearing motivated people and gave them the courage and the evidence that what he said he was going to do, he did. Who he was, he claimed to be, and what he claimed to do, he backed up. The resurrection is the exclamation point on Christianity because Buddhism can be true without Buddha. You guys know this? Buddhism can be true without Buddha. Christianity cannot be true without Christ. It makes it totally unique. It's a unique faith in the world. And we can bank on the proofs that Christ has been risen. Hundreds of people's lives have been transformed by it. So in order for conviction and persuasion to work, there's two things that are important. There's, there's incarnation presence. What I mean by that is not only did Christ come to the, into the world, he had to come into the world in order to come into your hearts. That's what the It makes no good a big deal if Christ just came into the world to hang out with us. He came to transform us. Conviction arises out of conversion. Incarnational presence is Christ alive in you which then helps us to understand resurrection power that now is the continual work of God on our behalf to do what he wants us to do. Uh, this is probably one of the most exciting elements of the book of Acts I'm looking forward to, is what does a reliance and dependency upon the Holy Spirit, what does his empowering look like in our lives? Because I want us to see God do things that at the end of the day, only he can get the credit for. It's like what John says in John 16, verse 7 through 11. Look, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, just as Jesus speaking, that it's your advantage that I go away. Because when Jesus leaves, the disciples are freaking out. Remember the most important message to the least qualified people. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Who's the helper? The Holy Spirit. And what John 14 and John 16 tell us is the remarkable work of the Holy Spirit through the disciples of Jesus. He will, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteous judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteous because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. This is the work of the Spirit, doing through us what we could never do for ourselves. Amen? So that's the importance of resurrection power. And why do we need this? Because I think most of us suffer terribly from an inferiority complex when it comes to our presence in this culture. Would, would you agree with me? That I think if we don't deal with inferiority, we deal that with a message that we feel is irrelevant to this world. Irrelevant. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's no reason to feel inferior and there's no reason to feel like your message is irrelevant. We have experienced a world whose gods are collapsing every single day. If there's nothing the past two years have shown us is all the things we put our trust and security in topple because they were never meant for us to, to trust in. God wants you to trust in him. There's a, there's a movie out right now, speaking of movies. I haven't seen it yet. Oh I know, seriously. <laughs> if I wasn't doing funerals and such services and all this stuff, Rochelle, I'd have all the... No, no, it's called Don't Look Up. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Leonardo DiCaprio... Uh, Jennifer Lawrence. So I love the premise of the movie. I like the writer of the movie, a guy named Adam McKay. And the, the story is that there's a giant meteor coming to earth. And these two scientists are pleading with everybody, we're all going to die. 
why? Right? And so the, the message really comes out of a heart for climate change. And, and this is what McKay, so I heard on NPR, yes, I love Jesus, listen to NPR, two can coexist. I was listening to NPR with an interview with McKay, and, and he said something interesting, and I got the transcript right here, and I want to read it for you. Because listening to this interview, you would think the writer, director, the world will be saved through climate change. That's the message I got. I'm thinking to myself, this is what this guy is living for and breathing for and, and ready to die, die for. He's an evangelist for climate change. And he says something, he goes, you know what? He goes, this, this is a message that's urgent. He says in his own words, and we, we were frustrated that people aren't taking the topic of climate change more seriously. So they, they and this is the fun thing with, a, it's kind of a comedy, right? So it's a satire. Satire takes important issues and brings maybe a comical tone to it. But listen what he says. Uh, the message is urgent, and I think we were frustrated. And I was trying to think of a way to tell the story. Uh, and one of the guys I was working with offhandedly said, yeah, it's like a giant comet's about to hit Earth, and no one cares. And I just immediately was like, that's it. That's the idea. We need to make a movie, spend countless hours and millions and millions of dollars to make a movie about how important climate change is. And I thought to myself, if this guy can leverage so many hours and so many resources to make a movie about climate change? What the heck are we as Christians doing who say we believe Jesus is coming back? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, big meteor, scary. Son of God, scarier. Amen? What is a profit a person if they save the climate and yet lose their soul? What is a profit a person if they get their person in the White House that aligns with their political views and yet lose their soul? I'm not saying that these topics like politics and climate change are not important, but you got people living and breathing for things that aren't ultimately eternally important. Christians, you're either a missionary or you're an imposter. Could Christ come back at any moment? Yeah. Where's your neighbor at? Where's your brother at? Where's your parent, mom, dad at? Where's your coworker at? You know, we keep having these conversations about, oh, Cowboys, Cardinals, who gives a damn? <laughs> Literally, who gives a damn? I don't. I talk a big game, but at the end of the day, if you don't use it, I don't care what, what team you're rooting for. If you're not team Jesus, you're a loser. And I can say that to you. I'm not going to say that to the world, right? <laughs> as much as I want to at times. Do you get what I'm saying? Conviction leads to persuasion. When you understand what I'm talking about, you're persuaded to tell people. If Christ has taken up residence in your life, and you've got that resurrection power that you're tapped into by the Holy Spirit, there's a conviction that leads you to tell people about him. Amen? Amen? Last point, we close with this. And let me just say, resurrection power, we're going to talk more about that next week. So last point is the message, communication, and our proclamation. So what do we need to share? There's no greater topic than the kingdom of God. Because what I just described to you, whether it be this movie that talked about climate change or, or any other um, ideology out in the world, we are experiencing kingdoms and conflict. What did Jesus tell the disciples about for 40 days? The kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? It's, it's the reign and rule of God in, in hearts of people that remind us this world is not all there is. And, and how we've bought into cheap kings and kingdoms, haven't we? We're seeing kings and kingdoms topple all around us. But there's one king and kingdom that will reign forever, Amen. His name is Jesus. Daniel chapter 2. Even Daniel said there's a statue that represents the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians and the Greeks and the Romans. But then there's this rock that comes in and crushes the feet of the statue and the whole thing crumbles. That rock is Jesus. You need to realize that there's a kingdom that's breaking into this world. And it's not a kingdom that's going to overthrow the military. And it's not a kingdom that's going to overthrow the government. It's a kingdom that's going to overturn individual hearts of men and women. That's the kingdom. 
And if you're here and you've experienced the king's reign in your life, you, you have an you incredible king and now you're living for an entirely different kingdom. But yet the world does not understand this yet. And this is why our proclamation and communication of this is so important. Jesus said for 40 days, I need to gather up the disciples and remind them what's important. What's important? The kingdom of God. Have you surrendered to the king and allowed his loving and gracious rule to take over your life? Because it does make a difference. And do you realize that people are living for, for false kings and false kingdoms and their lives are being destroyed all around us? And what are we doing about it? I read of a story this week. You're not going to believe this. 11-year-old kid out of Oklahoma in one day saved two people. In the morning, a fellow student from choking, he gave him the Heimlich maneuver, saved his life, and later that afternoon was walking, saw a house fire, and pulled an old woman from her house that was on fire. One day, this 11-year-old kid is awarded not only the police this medal of honor, but by his school, this medal of heroism. Why? Because he was a kid who was in tune to the danger people in his life were experiencing. And if an 11-year-old kid can do the Heimlich maneuver and rescue a woman from her burning house, do we as believers have the spiritual eyes to see the danger that all the people in our lives are, are, are privy to right now? We need a rescue because people are choking because their marriages are being destroyed and people are choking because financially they're struggling and people are choking because they're struggling with addiction and people are choking because they're trying to find some sort of significance and they're filling their lives with all sorts of cheap substitutes. They're choking from the lack of hope and they're choking from the lack of encouragement and they're choking from the lack of joy and they're choking from the lack of love and we sit there and with Jesus can do the Heimlich maneuver on them and let them know that there's something worth living for. Are you, are you, are you that in tune? And there's people in the danger of fire that there's people that will not spend eternity with us who are saved with Christ. They will spend a Christless eternity experiencing some real fire. Do we care? Are we passing by the lives of individuals like, oh, they're going to die, it's okay. You're either a missionary or you're an imposter. I pray that the book of Acts shows us what is important. That's the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will take care of themselves. Have you come to know the king? Are you part of his wonderful kingdom? Because once you taste and see that the Lord is good, you want others to be a part of this too. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I love you guys. I'm excited. I'm excited for what God has in store for us. I hope you are too. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the hope that you who began a good work in us are perfecting that work. And, and that's just not me as an individual, that's us together. That the work of the gospel continues. The building of the church continues the expansion of your kingdom continues. Thank you for allowing us to be a part. Thank you for being such a good and gracious king. Lord, remind us of what the kingdom is all about. Instruct us in new ways. Remind us of what we already know and help us to live with eternity in view. Find us faithful here and now for the work that you want your people to do. And I pray that we would love the work and have courage to do the work together until the day we meet you face to face. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Pray for me as I go minister to some, some messy people here in a bit. But may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord continue to shine his face upon you and give you grace and peace forever and ever. Amen.